for someone to get a little bit of background on you, NC State through and through, right? Can you give me a little <laughs> history here on um, your career and where you've been so far? Yeah. So I, you know, I've been at the Hurricane Center for about 15 years. Um, I came there in 2008 as a hurricane specialist. So I worked in that role for about eight or eight years, eight or nine years. Um, so doing forecasts, day-to-day hurricane forecasts, doing some applied research, some other technical development tools, that that type of thing. You know, got to forecast some pretty memorable storms like Sandy, Irene, uh, you know, coming in through the, the early parts of the 2010s. Um, I became, I was acting branch chief of the hurricane specialist unit starting in 2017 for Irma, Maria, Harvey, um, and then, you know, took over the job permanently in 2018. And it's been, you know, been a pretty busy stretch since with storms like Michael going back all the way up through last year with Ian, uh, and, you know, became the director back in April. Um, so it's, uh, it's been an interesting few years. Uh, you know, prior to that, I was the science officer at the weather prediction center for about a year and a half which has a huge, large scale responsibility of, you know, forecasting all sorts of weather across the United States from being the backup of the hurricane center to winter weather and snow to heavy rainfall, medium range forecasting, all of that. Anything in particular from your youth that kicked off a love of not only weather, but tropical weather? I mean, I think like most meteorologists, I had a pretty, you know, a pretty big interest in weather almost as long as I can remember from an early age. Um, you know, I grew up in, in Roanoke, Virginia, kind of a mid-latitude place, you know, pretty four distinct seasons, lots of interesting weather, winter weather, severe weather, remnants of hurricanes, things like that. So, uh, you know, sort of was exposed to a lot, a, a lot of different kinds of weather as a kid. All right, so we've been in a kind of lull here for a while where there hasn't been an official director of the Hurricane Center. So I want to talk about your role there. What kind yeah. of big decisions do you make as the director of the Hurricane Center? Well, you know, the, the, it's a higher level type position, you know, it's not as involved in the day to day, you know, making the forecast like I used to be, but you know, it's sort of setting the overall you know, vision and goals of the center, where we want to go in the next, you know, five years, what do we want to do in terms of improved products and services, but there's a huge communication aspect to it too. The, the, the public awareness and training and, uh, you know, conferences that we're doing now, the hurricane awareness tour we just did last week, again, just kind of making people aware every year, Hey, hurricane season's coming. It's also sort of being the lead voice for preparedness and information when a storm is threatening. You know, we're working with the media, we're working with emergency managers, government officials. We have a huge international responsibility that I have a role in as chair of the the World Meteorological Organization Region 4 Hurricane Committee. And we work with, you know, more than 20 different countries across the Caribbean, Central America, Bermuda, Canada, that all are affected and all with all are within our area of responsibility. So it's a really interesting job. It's a multifaceted. Uh, there's there's really not never any downtime. Yeah. So you talked about the next five years and vision. Do you I know it's only been a month. Do you have a Thanks. vision yet? Is there any sort of plan in place for what the next five years might look like? Well, I think, you know, there's sort of two pieces I, I think of, you know, we're always working on the, the physical science side. We're always trying to make the forecast better. We're always trying to improve our understanding of what, you know, how hurricanes work, getting more data to the forecasters, better models, better information. So we want to really improve the forecast of the hazards. That's what we're really trying to move towards. You know, the water hazard, storm surge, rainfall, flooding are what kill the most people. Uh, you know, we want to improve the hazard products we have that are probabilistically based. We want to make them more actionable. We want to push them out to longer lead times. We want to ensure that they have more real time uncertainty information and incorporated into them, which they don't really now. They usually are based on our climatological error distributions. You know, how many, you know, what were our typical errors for track and intensity forecast over the past few years, rather than, than being more representative of the situational forecast uncertainty. So that's an area we need to move in. The other part is just the communications part. You know, we have to continue to be uh, innovative and push into new communication spaces, social media, live streams, reaching out because we, we people are getting information from such a wide variety of, of places now. And the information landscape is evolving rapidly. We really have to be nimble and be able to respond and be in those spaces so that we can you know, make sure that we have that our voice is getting out there amidst all the other information that people consume. But going back to the hazards, you mentioned storm surge. I heard there's a new update to the storm surge model. Is that correct? Yeah, the the weather services, the you know, probabilistic storm surge model called P surge just had an upgrade go in, and there's a couple of different pieces to that. Um, one is it's going to allow us to issue real time forecast storm surge forecast information out as much as 72 hours in advance of the arrival of the storm. 
Uh, so we're pushing that out to longer lead times because people are making evacuation decisions and other preparedness decisions involving storm surge even well beyond three days. But now we're pushing that out to three days. The other piece is that it allows us to run P surge for two storms at once. So if we had a situation where we had a storm affecting, say, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and another storm affecting the Gulf Coast or a Gulf Coast and East Coast storm simultaneously, we'd be able to run the real-time storm surge modeling for both storms at the same time. And then kind of pairing that with the communication aspect of things, do you think that the public generally understands when they see the storm surge forecast what that actually means? Well, I think, you know, I, I think it depends. I mean, some people are, are pretty familiar with storm surge. If they live in a very storm, storm surge prone area, they may, you know, understand what it is. I think one of the challenges, though, is when you talk about these very extreme storm surge events like we had in Ian last year, where you're talking about 10 to 15 feet of inundation. I think it's hard for some people to understand what that means. You know, like as physical scientists, we understand, you know, what that's going to do to a community, not just the inundation itself, but the devastating wave action on top of it. So it's a challenge for us to help people visualize and understand, you know, 10 to 15 feet could be a really abstract term or abstract concept to people. You know, we're working with the social science community to help, you know, create visuals that show, you know, okay, here's what a, a city landmark might look like with 10 feet of inundation or 15 feet of inundation so that you, uh, you can help visualize, help people visualize what those impacts are going to be. I mean, the other thing we, have to really focus on again, and, and this product hasn't been around for you know, too many years, but the storm surge warning has been around since 2017. And it's really sort of the most dire warning that we can issue. It means that you're at risk of life-threatening inundation from surge, which is the potential you know, leading killer of people in, in tropical storms and hurricanes in this country it has the potential to kill the most people on a given day, as we saw in Ian last year. So we really want people to pay attention to that storm surge warning. If you're in an area under the storm surge warning, that means your life is in jeopardy. And that if you're asked to leave your home, you really need to do so. And then uh, more of the communication side of things. I've, there's been a lot of new directors uh, among NOAA, I feel like, in the past year. Every single one of them has told me uh, that communication is definitely a big push of theirs and specifically inclusive communication. So I'm yeah. curious how the Hurricane Center can um, warn everybody and be inclusive. Are there any goals there? Yeah, you know, we're working towards, uh, you know, offering products in multiple languages. You know, a huge part of our um, area responsibility is primarily Spanish speaking, especially internationally. But there's a huge Spanish speaking population in the United States as well. We have some limited products right now that are available in Spanish, but we're looking to expand that in the future and uh, potentially expand it to other languages as well so that people can at least get the information and consume it in the language that's their primary language, which will help help them understand that. You know, part of it is designing products, graphics, words, choosing colors, you know, involving the social science community so that we create products that people can actually understand. You know, as physical scientists, we for a long time created products that we liked because we understood how they looked or there might have been technical limitations as to how we could design them. Now we're involving more of the social science community. We're doing focus groups, talking to users understanding, okay, well, you need to use these words and these colors and these this kind of depiction of the of the information so that people can actually, you know, consume and understand it. I think the other part is again, we we need to be in spaces where people are. We know people consume information on lots of different devices. There's huge generational differences in how people get information from television to social media to your phone to the computer. You know, again, we have to be able to be in all those spaces and make sure that our voice is out there. Uh, and you know, we need to reach underserved communities, historically underserved communities, and make sure that we're going and doing outreach and, and education in, 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 that area, in those areas in the United States and also internationally. We just undertook a Caribbean hurricane awareness tour where we stopped in multiple countries. We also stopped in Puerto Rico. We just did the hurricane awareness tour along the Gulf Coast. We went to Jackson, Mississippi, New Orleans, Tallahassee, Houston area, and trying to get out into, into communities and make sure that they, you know, we're accessible and that people can come and understand uh, understand our products and hurricane hazards. Yeah, I mean, you brought a good point there. There's like kind of the obvious marginalized communities, but then there's also, you know, like the colorblind community. And so right. it, it's interesting to think about all the different uh, people that need to be served. Um, yep. Okay, well, the last kind of point I want to hit is talking about this season. Everybody always asks, I, they ask me as a meteorologist, what does this season look like? What does the season look like? And um, I like to stay very vague. And the Hurricane Center doesn't put out an official forecast for the season, correct? But is there anything you can tell me about expectations for this season, especially given kind of the change here from La Nina to El Nino? 
Well, I mean, my short answer is that we're going to have hurricanes. Um, we don't know where they're going to go. We don't know how many they're going to be, but that the risk is there and people have to prepare for the season regardless. Now, of course, everybody knows El Nino appears to be coming on in the Pacific and all things being equal, that does tend to, you know, uh, limit tropical storm and hurricane activity in the Atlantic Basin to some degree. But there are other factors. We know the Atlantic Basin sea surface temperatures are quite warm right now, which would argue for more favorable conditions for storms. So, you know, I don't want people to get too hung up on the seasonal forecast. There's uncertainty associated with that. You know, NOAA puts out its forecast in May, but then it updates it again in, in August as we get towards the peak of the season. You know, most of the activity happens August, September, October. Um, we can have quiet stretches during uh, otherwise impactful hurricane seasons. You go back to 2022, everybody started to wonder in August, it was really quiet. It was like, are we going to have any storms? And then we had lots of hurricanes in September. We had a hurricane landfall in the United States in November. So um, as a reminder that the season is you know, five months long, the risk is pretty much there the entire season. And again, regard even if it's an otherwise quiet season, there can still be impactful storms. There can still be major hurricane landfalls, heavy rainfall events, which are almost entirely unrelated to how strong a storm is. It doesn't take you know, even in the overall unfavorable environment, there can still be periods of time and locations where conditions are favorable and storms can form in those those uh, small windows of opportunity. So. Cool. Well, Mike Brennan, congratulations on your new role. Good luck with everything. Thanks. And let's hope for a very quiet season. <laughs> we could hope. Thanks, Emily. Hey, thank you so much for watching. While you're here, check out some other videos you just may like. Thank you.